ushers are finishing up here, I want to say part of a verse. I want to know if you can finish it for me or with me. How good and pleasant it is when God's people... It's oh. good. All right. Let's see, this is teaching. See, I, I, I would have had a hard time with this too, so it's okay. There, there's no condemnation in this. Um, from Psalm 133, it says, How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. Unity is a thing that I think probably for most of the last six months, it's been hard for us to do. Probably in, in part just because of proximity, right? It's hard to live in unity when everybody is off, isolated, and forced to kind of do their own thing. And then now as things have started to open up again, it seems like unity is even more difficult because everybody is on different ends of the spectrum of, in terms of what we should be doing or what's the right thing to do or how we should proceed or things like that. But unity is something that is good and pleasant. And it is something that God calls for us to do. To, to finish up, it's a very short chapter in Psalm 133. Verse 2, it says, It is like precious oil poured on the head. It's like the dew of Hermon, as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. For there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life evermore. It is good and pleasant when God's people live together in unity. And so we're going to continue our series on our church doctrine, our, our series called Following the Map. Um, and we, we've gone topics of the Godhead. We've gone topics of, of now we're on the, the topic of the church. Um, and we're going to talk about one of the reasons the church exists, one of the things, the, the key parts of of bringing the church together and why it is so important. And it really is this, this purpose, this, this thing that we call unity. But unity is, is one of those really hot topics uh, kind of nowadays. I mean, everything from, uh, you know, the way that we name our companies. You know, we, we got United Dairy Farmers. We got the United Way. We got United Airlines. I mean, United States of America. I mean, there's, we, we want unity. We want things to, get, to come together. Even the, the Democratic National Convention, its theme this year was uniting America. Now, I'm not going to comment on whether or not it did that or whether or not that will move to that end. But, but everybody wants unity. But there is purpose and there is important ways to go about seeking unity. You know, Francis Chan, I don't know, some of you might be familiar with him, he said that, I don't believe God wants our church life to be centered on buildings and services, which is good since the last few months we haven't been able to do that pretty regularly. But instead, God wants our churches to be focused on active discipleship, on mission, and on the pursuit of unity. So... So as we look into this, um, I pray that God will, will really reveal to us what that means and what this should look like. So pray with me before we jump into this. Our great God and Father, we come before you now thankful that we can actually be here in this place, that we can come together as a body of believers to worship you together and we have missed that and so God we we look to you for our help for our healing for our purpose in life and we look to you to be a God who will unite us with one another and will unite us to you and to your heart and so, Father, this morning, I pray that my words be words that are true and words that are encouraging where they need to be and words um, that will poke at us where we need to be poked at. But ultimately, may they come from you and your word 
uh, to mold us into the uh, to image of your son and what the purpose you have for us as your church. So pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 17 with me. And if you don't have your Bibles, that's okay. Uh, the text that we're going to be reading out of is there in your bulletin. But first, just let me define what unity is. And, I mean, it's something that I think we kind of know, well, at least we think we know. Uh, but it's not always uh, something that we can easily define. But it is a mindset of people who have the same passion about something, right? It's pretty simple. It's the mindset that we all have if we have the same passion about pursuing one thing. So you could be united in your, your love for University of Michigan, right? There's a few of us in this room that would do that. There, we might be united in <laughs> a few people shaking their heads. No, I'm sorry. Um, we could be united in you know, our love for a certain kind of food or, or other kinds of activities. But we as the church should be people who have the same mindset as we have the same passion about what God wants us to do. And so we're going to look at what that passion should be. But even though unity is this common thing, it, we have to be careful because we don't want to be just united just for the sake of being united. We need to ask ourselves sort of these questions that you see up here on the screen, but because it's important to know who is the one doing the uniting. Is it somebody that we want to be linking arms with? Is it somebody that it's worth following and listening to? What do they mean by uniting? Does it mean, you know, you have to just agree with me or link arms in something or that you actually have to have the same worldview or, you know, there could be something, you know, you think it's one thing and they think it's something else. Then you come together like, whoa, wait a second. Yeah. Then what are we uniting around? There are good causes to be uniting around and there are bad causes. That is part of the question why some people, even within the church, are hesitant to do uh, and come into agreement with things like the Black Lives Matter thing. Because I think all of us would agree the importance of lifting up and elevating people and minorities and black people who have been oppressed over time. And that is an important thing, and we need to be doing that as a church. But we don't want to be linking arms with an organization that has other things is a part of their agenda and worldview. And then the last question, why are we uniting? Like what, you know, it's like there's, there are times to do that, there are other times not to do it. Why would we be doing this here and now? And so it, we don't just come together for the sake of coming together. We are a people who have the same mindset and the same passion or something. So if you have your Bibles there in John 17, I'm going to start reading in verse 14. And we're going to go all the way down to verse 24. And this is what is referred to commonly as Jesus' high priestly prayer. Uh, this is uh, right before his crucifixion, right before he dies on the cross and is raised again. And he's praying for his disciples here in his, the, his last few moments before all of those events take place. And so read with me here in verse 14. He says, I have given them, referring to his disciples, your word. And the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask them, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Just a side note, that's, that's you and me. He is praying for us. 
in this moment. That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. And in verse 22, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them. That they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and you in me. That they may become perfectly one. So that the world may know that you have sent me, and love them, even as you loved me. Verse 24. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am. To see my glory that you have given me because you love me before the foundation of the world. So here in this, Jesus is praying for his disciples. And he's praying for the future church that will be formed because of them and their testimony. He's praying for future believers. He's praying for you and me. And this is one of those favorite passages of those who want to promote a so-called ecumenical movement getting rid of all denominations and other things, and that the world should just come together as one big, happy church. And admittedly, a church that is divided, that has you know, a whole ton of different denominations. Last time I looked, there were 28 different Baptist denominations. Not to mention the Methodist and Presbyterian and everything else. And admittedly, a divided church like that kind of looks like a scandal. Like, why can't you people just get along, right? But there are reasons for that, and we will actually talk about this in, a, in the upcoming weeks of why we believe what we believe and why we would identify ourselves as Baptists. But we're not going to talk about that now. But Jesus was not praying for the unity of a single worldwide church here in which doctrinal Error and heresy sits right next to Christian orthodoxy and perfect harmony because that just can't happen. Instead, he was praying for unity of love and a unity of obedience to God. Praying for unity and obedience to his word and a united commitment to God's will. So we're going to look at four things here that are in this passage, that this passage teaches us about biblical unity within the church. So again, in your notes, you have some spots there that you can fill in the gaps, fill in the blanks. Um, And like I said, we're going to look at four things here. The first one is that unity, or biblical unity, is a reflection of the Godhead of the Trinity. So if you've been around EBC for a while, uh, and you recall even like the beginning of this sermon series where we talked about the Godhead, we talked about the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and we talked about the Trinity, that there is one eternal God, holy and righteous, the Creator, He's our Savior, and that this God, as revealed in the Bible, exists in three distinct persons. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That God is one in essence and three in persons. Basically, he's three who's in one what. Well, that's obviously a very oversimplification in terms of all that we were talking about and all that that doctrine entails. But that is the Godhead. And our unity as a church is a reflection of, of the unity that exists within the Godhead. So we can look back at verses 20 there in our passage that we read. It says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you. They, they also may be in us. The unity of the Godhead is a model for all Christians. It's a model for the church, the visible local body, and the, and the invisible, capital C, global church. And it's a model for how we as distinct individuals could and should interact with one another. 
Um, now, this unity is not a diversity of beliefs, but it is really a, a diversity of the people within it. These are the people who are moving on mission in harmony with one another. You know, this is at the heart of what Paul teaches in Galatians 3, where it says that there is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor th free, male or female, dare I add, neither black nor white, nor rich nor poor, nor educated or uneducated. For all of us are one in Christ Jesus. Unity is each individual person who is in Christ, no matter what label they would have wore before they came to Christ, that they are now one in Christ. And just as God is one, we share the same unity and fellowship with the Godhead. For when we, the church, live in unity with each other, we reflect the nature and the character of God. That in our diversity, in our uniqueness, that we can come together as one to fulfill his plan, his mission. So that's the first thing. That unity is a reflection of the Godhead. But the second is that unity is the expression of God's design. Now there are a couple of things I want to say here when it comes to, to this point. Unity is, is it's a pretty important topic throughout the Bible, and especially in the New Testament. Uh, in fact, it's a theme that's mentioned in nearly all of the New Testament books. Uh, in the book of Acts alone, no less than 11 times is it talked about that the, the new church that had just been formed was coming together in one accord that they were like-minded, that they were in agreement, that they did things together. In the 28 chapters of the book of Acts, that was, that's mentioned at least 11 times. And the Apostle Paul certainly understood the reality that we as, as people, even people who are in Christ, have a propensity to be at odds with one another because he mentions it in nearly every single one of his writings. In Romans, and 1 Corinthians, and Philippians, Ephesians, Philemon, 1 Thessalonians, 1 Timothy, and probably some of the others as well. Those are just the quick ones I can think of. Not to mention, John talks about it in his letters. Peter talks about it in his letters. It's an important thing that we need to get a grip on, that, it, that we as a body need to be unified. So while it's important, we need to recognize that it doesn't come from ourselves. That unity comes from outside of ourselves. Unity is born of truth, and that truth is the word of God. It is his truth that sanctifies us and brings us together. And unity that is the expression of God's design must come from God himself. In other words, unity is based on the truth of Scripture. The unity of the church is one in correspondence and continuity with the proper understanding of God's will as revealed in Scripture. The unity of the church derives from the testimony of Scripture even if a significant number of believers disagree. Because we don't look to ourselves, we look to the scripture as the, uh, as the objective source of truth. And that's what we rally around. That's what unites us. Again, let's look at our passage again. It says, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in 
the truth. Notice that Jesus is talking about God's word here, the truth. There cannot be a unity where there's false teaching and false beliefs and essential matters. Unity of the church is one in agreement with the proper understanding of God's will. It's not from common feelings. It's not from common backgrounds, although obviously you can have some unity in these things. It's not from social relationships or even shared experiences. While it can be expressed in all of those things, Unity is from outside of ourselves. It comes from our commitment to Christ and his word. So anything less than a full agreement with Christ and his word makes real unity impossible. So, and you hear a lot about oneness and diversity in, in different things, in different uh, ways that churches talk or ways that different uh, parachurch organizations, even I, I'm on staff with Campus Crusade for Christ, with crew, and there's a big talk about oneness and diversity, and we certainly need that as an organization in different ways, but it kind of leaves the impression that unity is based on the idea of unity itself, like we got to have unity because we just have to be together, we have to be one, we have to be in agreement, but true unity of the church is a gift from God. And then the church is already diverse. God has brought people to himself from all over the world, all different cultures, all different backgrounds. We're already diverse. But the goal of the church is not simply diversity. Instead, it's the expression of God's design when the church seeks to live in conformity with God's will as it's revealed in Scripture. And it's all of God's will. It's not taking one part of it and clinging to that and running with that. It's taking what God has revealed in Scripture and living that out, living out that mission. All right, so unity is a reflection of the Godhead. It's the expression of God's design. And the third thing here is that unity is a prerequisite for the church to fulfill its mission. So in a few weeks, we're going to talk in more detail about the, the, the mission of the church, why we come together in the first place. Uh, in fact, you've actually already had a little taste of that last week as Greg talked about uh, the purpose of the church. Uh, but simply put, the mission of the church is to tell the world about Jesus. It's pretty simple. Listen to this quote from uh, C.S. Lewis. The church exists for nothing else but to draw men into Christ, to make them little Christs. If they are not doing that, all the cathedrals, clergy, missions, sermons, even the Bible itself are simply a waste of time. All these things are a waste of time. If we as the church are not drawing people to Jesus, we're not drawing people to this building. We're not drawing people to just love one another. We're not drawing people to a, a moral and ethical lifestyle. We're not drawing people just to a community of people who are nice and good and friendly and kind to each other. Our purpose is to tell people about Jesus. That's it. It really is it. If blast isn't pointing our kids to Jesus, we shouldn't have blast. Right, Rana? If our Sunday morning services aren't moving all of us closer to Jesus, then we shouldn't be here. If when we go out into our jobs and our sole purpose of our jobs is to make money, you're missing the point of why God saved you in the first place. It's imperative for the church to have unity if we're going to be successful in reaching the world for Christ. 
We can't have little pockets, little islands within the church saying, well, this is what I want to do. I think we as a church need to be doing X, Y, and Z. And that we should be doing A, B, and C. But when the church might be saying, what God's word is saying is that we should be doing, I don't know, what other letters have I? L, M, N, L, P. Um we have one purpose. And said, again, let's look at the passage here, that, um, here in John 17. And I love this because it says that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. And later on in verse 23, it says that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me. And love them, even as you love me. Be one so that. There's a cause and effect in here. And, and I'm not going to say it's a, a parallel one-on-one -on -one cause and effect here. But there is a, we're not going to be effective in reaching the world for Christ if we are not unified. When we are unified with each other and unified with God, we will have a profound impact on the world. The world will come to know Jesus when they see Jesus in us. And believers are to become united in mission and purpose to impact the community through the gospel of Jesus. That's, that's our primary mission here at the church, to honor God and to love people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. And when you're familiar with the verse, you know, that the your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. They will know us by our love. And those of you who are DC Talk fans, you know, back from the early 90s, where you will recognize this quote from Brennan Manning that's at the beginning of one of their songs. It says, The greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips and walk out of the door and deny him with their lifestyle." That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. Now, in part, that, that's talking a little bit about life hypocrisy and that people just can't get Jesus if they see us being hypocritical. But the biggest hypocrisy that I think we have as a church at times is that we come in and say that we're one, yet we don't act that way toward one another. That we, we can't even agree on if we can tolerate a certain style of music or a certain type of leadership or a certain length of service. And so we break fellowship with people for those types of things rather than coming together and saying this is how we will love each other and love the world in order to reach them for Jesus. I can go on and on about that one. I don't want to be on my soapbox. But. So that's the third. The fourth one is this. and That unity is a foreshadow, a precursor to heaven. And Jesus certainly had an eternity in mind when he prayed for his disciples and he prayed for the church. He said... Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am to see my glory. Um, you know, while, while I emphasize the to be with me, you know, to be with, with Jesus in heaven is something to look forward to. I really like the word desire in that. Jesus wants us to be with him. He wants us to spend eternity in heaven with him. It's not that he's just, he didn't just save us so we get to punch our ticket into heaven and then we can go off into a back corner and just kind of not be with Jesus. He desires for us to be with him in fellowship. Just like I desire to do things with my kids. When I have projects with my kids, I want them to do it, not just because I need extra set of hands, which I often do, 
but because I want to spend time with my kids. Jesus desires for us to be with him in heaven. And when we're there, when we're going to be there, it's not going to look like this room. Heaven's going to be much more diverse than even Xenia itself. And you know, we have a lot of our homogeneous aspects here within our community at times and in this place. And by God's grace, we're able to connect with anybody who comes in our path. And that is our heart. But heaven's going to look even more diverse than this room. You know, we're familiar with the passage in Rome, uh, Revelation 7. It says, I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in their white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. From every nation, from every tribe, every people and language. If we can't tolerate walking down the street, hearing somebody from a different ethnicity speaking a different language, we're going to have a hard time in heaven. If we can't tolerate being in a room where people dress differently than us. Well, actually, we're all going to be dressed the same there in our white robes, so maybe that's not a good example. But, but if we can't tolerate the differences that we just have as people the way that God made us, we're not going to be able to make it in heaven. Because we're going to be different. I mean, there's going to be a lot to do. I, I love being on staff with Campus Crusade and being able to travel all the different places I've been. And seeing how people, different people worship. And hearing them praise God in different ways. People actually clap their hands when they sing songs. Oh my goodness. Some people actually raise their hands when they sing. I know. I, I'll admit, I'm a little uncomfortable with them. It's just not me. It's not my thing. But I love seeing other people do it. And that's what heaven's going to be like. There's going to be a diversity of people there, but we will all be unified toward Jesus at that moment. And that's what brings us together. All right, so let me wrap it up with this. So unity, these, these four aspects of spiritual unity is a pattern for the church. Jesus was not calling for a uniformity, nor was he calling for agreement in external opinion. And actually, he was sort of predicating that this unity would be one based on nature. One of nature, just as he and God the Father are one being. That our unity is, is one of nature. Without the union with Jesus and the Father, Christians can do nothing. And so the goal is to be expressed, is the expression of the Father's will or of God's design here. And that design is to become united in mission and purpose to impact the community through the gospel. And the result of all of this will be that the world will believe. And when that happens, we'll get a glimpse of what heaven's going to be like. So pray with me as we, as we wrap up here. Father, you are good to us. And God, we admit that we as people, we, we like things the way that we like things. And that uh, sometimes the way that we like things, we think are the way that things should be. God, you are so much bigger than our own preferences or desires. You are calling us to something beyond ourselves, beyond this church, beyond this building. To be united in Jesus toward you and toward your mission. 
And so, God, I pray that you will make this church, and, and I, I, I want that for the, the church worldwide, but and I can only be responsible for those under our, our lead and our care. So, God, I pray for this church that we would be united in our hearts toward one another, toward our mission, and that we would go after the things that you want us to in terms of reaching this world for Christ, that we would not be distracted by all the different things that this world calls us to. There are things out there that are supremely important, but God, you've given us a mission, so help us to stay on mission. Make us one. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. As the worship team comes up, um, I want to, for those of us who are, are meeting in care groups or for those of us who uh, may want some things for reflection uh, over the next week, um, here are five questions for you to ask yourselves or to talk amongst with your, your care group. By what indicators do we usually judge unity in our church? We have a lot of different things. You know, do we all in agreement with the style of preaching or the style of worship, or are we all in agreement with what activities we should do? But what indicators do we use, or should we be using? And are those standards legitimate measures of our unity? And then what is the biblical standard for unity? And why is there a lack of unity? And then how can we achieve it? And, and I just want to say on that last one, Man, we need to be praying with and for each other. We cannot, there's no way, there's no way that you can be at odds with somebody if you are praying for them. And if you're praying with them, how much more difficult it is for you to walk away and, and be in conflict with them. So we need to, as a church to be praying with and praying for one another and to be going after this mission together. So just some things for us to, to be thinking about and talking through with each other as we go through our week.